So as we continue our day of retreat, um, just uh, introduce myself a little bit for those who uh, don't know me. I'm, my name is Michael. I'm also from Bourbon Day. Um, yeah, uh, with uh, Father James, we're actually good friends, good companions. And now my task is to contradict him. <laughs> so, you know, in community life, we need to make things a bit lively. So he was talking about death. And I'm going to talk about life. <laughs> and hopefully, we can take this hello hello of life and death and, and make it a beautiful um, fruit no, that you can take away from this uh, retreat. But uh, coming back to a little bit of an uh, introduction, um, I am from Singapore. I was in the Philippines for about 16 years um, before going to Rome to study, and I just came back. So I'm very happy to be back, uh, honestly. Uh, feeling at home, no, as they say. Um, and I was uh, studying uh, civil engineering before. I worked as a civil engineer, but I specialized in the environment. So somehow I really love uh, images of nature. And today, somehow what came to mind as we're talking about uh, death and also life, uh, it came to me these two images of nature, which are sunrise and sunset. I don't know about you, no, but uh, just start us thinking a little bit. Which is the most beautiful part of the day for you? you no, know, maybe it's lunchtime. I don't know. <laughs> it's dinner time. Could be the time when I'm going home from work. You know, the emotion of wow, that's it. You no, know, for the day. But for me, two of the most beautiful moments of the day are sunrise and sunset. Um. But if you think about it, these are the two moments that we spend the least time to think about, right? You wake up in the morning, you're rushing, you're doing this and that. The same for us missionaries. No, it doesn't mean we wake up to pray and we are, you know, so free from all the worries. Um, but yeah, sunrise and sunset, two most beautiful moments of the day that we seldom think about or contemplate, you know, as uh, Father James mentioned. And I liken these two moments as birth and death. Two of the most beautiful moments of our lives that we seldom contemplate because we are so busy with uh, the day, the, the rest of the day. But when we take time to contemplate these two moments, uh, they, it gives a different taste you know, to, the, to how you live each day. Uh, if you remember, no, I think all of us have had experience you not know, taking time to to enjoy the sunset, and you start the next day in a different way. You end the night differently as well. And I think this is what this recollection is all about. You know, to combine these two uh, contemplations of sunrise and sunset, life and death. This second moment of the retreat, I'd like to invite you to think not just of yourself, okay? Um, because we're talking about life and death, but how can we think about how our life and our death can go beyond ourselves to think of the ones who come after us, to think of our future generations? What does our life and our death have to do with future generations? Because one thing is to think about my own life and my own death. And when I just think about myself, about life and death, but it can be quite depressing <laughs> or it can be quite selfish, you know? So the only thing I live for is the life to come. And that's it. I want to save my soul. I want to enjoy heaven. But what is my life and death got to do with future generations for the people who come after us? What is the legacy that we want to leave behind through our life and our death? And so this session is a teaser. It's going to start with that theme, life and death in future, uh, sorry, in the perspective of future generations. So are you ready? <laughs> so now we're going to look at uh, a little video. Wait, be before I start, um, I'd just like to uh, let you know what are the things we're going to use for this session. It's going to be a bit more practical, okay? Because you've been praying, you've been listening, this is a time to work, okay? um, to work on our spiritual life. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take up two documents or two uh, 
uh, handouts uh, that we have here. Wait a minute, it's not open this time. Where is it? Um, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, now I want to, I'm going to do some share screen to let you see which are the two that, yeah, okay, so I think you all have this, uh, right, in your package. So we're going to use this one, which is uh, making a project of life, okay? So just to introduce some of the practical things before we go in. Um, so I hope you have this, if not uh, physically, at least virtually, you know, in your computer. But anyway, we'll use this just to let you know what we're going to do. And another one, we're going to take a look at uh, this one, which is uh, also the the orientation in order to make uh, the project of life. Okay, so two different one handout and one worksheet, if you if you like. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share for a moment of these two documents, um, and I'm going to play a little video, and this video is taken from the movie The Last Samurai. I'm not sure if you've heard about it. No. The last, no, because we're talking about sunrise, sunset, so the last one. Um, and uh, before we start this video, just to recall a bit the, the story so that you won't get lost, um, about this man who discovered the samurai as a foreigner who felt that they were a threat to modernity. You know, they're modernizing and they're these enemies who are defending their culture. And then he discovers the value that they had, that they were defending, and how they died for those values. And how modernity sometimes uh, discounts those values that we live for and that we die for. And how it affects the future generations. Okay, coming back to the theme of the perspective of the future, our children, our grandchildren. And what are the values that we want to transmit to them, especially the values of faith. So uh, in order to uh, put this movie in the perspective of our retreat, I invite you just to think of this, no? There's the emperor, which I would call the younger generation. There is his assistant, who is somehow the one who has taken on modernity. Modernity is not bad, okay? Uh, well, I'll explain later. And then there is the samurai, who are the ones who lived and died for their values. And I want you to think today of the saints who lived and died for the Christian values for the sake of future generations. Okay, so we're gonna just sit back, relax, and enjoy this little clip. And you can watch the whole movie later, okay? But just for now, <laughs> this is uh, what we're gonna watch. So I just like that, yeah, so yeah. This is Katsumoto's sword. He would have wanted you to have it. Let the strength of the samurai be with you always. Katsumoto's sword He hoped with his last breath that you would remember the ancestors who held this sword and what they died for. Here You were with him at the end. Hi, Emperor. This man fought against you. Your Highness, if you believe me to be your enemy, command me, and I will gladly take my life. I have 
dreamed of a unified Japan, of a country strong and independent and modern. And now we have railroads and canon Western clothing. We cannot forget who we are or where we come from. Ambassador Swanbeck have concluded that the treaty is not in the best interest of my people. Sir, if I may, so sorry. But you may not. This is an outrage. Heko! Omura! は国家のために全てを投げ打ってきたつもりです。それが誠であれば、お前の資産は募集し、民に分け与える。陛下、屈辱を賜りなさる。その屈辱に耐えられるなら。Tell me how he died. I'll tell you how he lived. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure you've been enjoying it. <laughs> Uh, so as I said, you can watch the whole movie later on um, because there's so much to reflect there about um, preserving our values for the future generations and how modernity is not our enemy. Uh, the technology that we have, uh, the new ways of doing things, uh, the influence that we have you know, in the world uh, of the internet, etc. But that speaks a lot about how can we defend our values in the midst of change. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, there's so much you can reflect on that, no? But I wanted to just take that scene because uh, I find it really helps us to reflect on that. I'm sure most of us here have uh, future generations to think about. And the point here is how would you uh, live and die for those values so that the younger generation uh, would take them. If you notice the emperor, who did he listen to in the end? Because it's very attractive. Modernity was so attractive and he listened to that in the beginning. But at the end of the day, who will our future generations listen to? Those who lived and died for their values. And I think that is our hope. That is what this retreat is all about. It's not just to reflect about our death, but it's to reflect about how we want to live and those daily deaths that Father James spoke about so that our future generations will listen, that they will listen. You know, uh, one of the reasons for this retreat or one of the basis, no, is our celebration of November 1 and 2, right? All saints and all souls. and all souls, we pray for the dead. And all saints, we pray for those people who lived for Christ. So death and life again, no? Sunrise and sunset of Christian life. Our lives. How can we live, uh, as, as we heard at the end of that clip, um, when the, the emperor asked, tell me how he died. And uh, Tom Cruise, okay. <laughs> so 
said, uh, no, I will tell you how he lived. And I invite you this uh, session to think about this phrase, because most of the time we know how Jesus died. And we celebrate a lot uh, Holy Week. And we focus a lot on how he died, he suffered for us, for our sins, and for all those things. But this second session, I invite you to think that the real disciple was not only with Jesus at the moment that he died. The real disciple of Christ is not only interested in how I feel bad or sorry that Jesus died for me. The real disciple is the one who's interested to know how he lived in order that he could die in such a way. Uh, we see here a little cross no, behind us. How did Jesus live? And this was what distinguished the disciples of Jesus, Peter, James, John, Andrew. They lived with him in Galilee. They lived with him when he healed. They lived with him when he preached. They lived with him when he laughed and he was cheering people up, encouraging them. They lived with him when he was challenging the Pharisees and all. And it's such a poor Christianity, if I may say so, if we just focus on his death and we forget that what the disciples saw was how he lived. That is why I really love this phrase you know, at the end of the movie. It's not just about how he died. Of course, that is the, the, the end of his mission. But he died and he rose again. But what we can learn from Jesus is how he lived. And this is what this second session is all about. The saints, when they reflected on death, they learned from Jesus how to live today. So let's go to the, 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 uh, the handout. No, I'll start again this um, share screen. And then, uh, oops, how is it uh, here? How come you say I can't go back? Oh, it's this one, right? I'll just yeah, shift to. Okay, thanks. So I've got a good uh, a priest assistant here. So James, Father James was saying Father Bong is a good assistant in some ways, and he is too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's go to this handout. I'll just bring you through this, and then um, let's see if we have some time no, that I can leave you for some reflection as well. So making a project of life, once again, it's not just about death but it's how to live well. So I'll just read a bit from there. It's just very brief, you can follow me. Introduction, life and death, two very interconnected realities that we do not often consider together. And this is what this retreat is all about. No, we started to look at death, now we're going to look at life. Considering death clearly, I'll just continue. Considering death clearly and squarely, so straight in the face, no? so as to know how to live better and more purposefully. So the objective of reflecting about death is not in itself, but how can we live well? And once again, I, help, I invite you to consider so that other generations can learn from the way we live as the saints learn from Jesus. So example, the saints and the connection with the feast of the saints. I, I already explained that a little bit. No? So, uh, you know, talking about future generations, um, you know, Paul, Francis is under a lot of criticism, pressures, etc. in this time. And many people ask me what my opinion is. And I say also about all of us, not the priest. And I would agree that he's not a perfect person. He doesn't always speak in the best ways. And it's really in the media, no, uh, much more than many people would like. But you know, there are some things that are very consistent in him and that uh, inspire me. And he says, in our generation, if you read this document called Laudato Si, no? it's about the environment, it's about the future generations, you know, the care for our common home, that we're not thinking just for our generation. We're thinking about what will the future generations inherit from the way that we live and the way that we're willing to die to ourselves sometimes. And so there he says there are three main challenges uh, that uh, we need to think about. And he says... We have a spiritual challenge, a cultural challenge, and an educational challenge. These are the three things that we need to change today. Spiritual, because of the way we pray, does our spirituality actually lead us to do something about our world or just to focus on ourselves? 
cultural challenge because it's not just about individual change. We're thinking about changing the society because what the younger generation suffers from so often, if we look at it today, it's not just that they're bad. They're not bad. They're not lost. It's just that the world has such a great influence. The culture influences them. Just like the emperor, he was moved with that modernity and he didn't know how to choose. And of course, the last, which is where I'm getting at, is the educational challenge. How do we teach future generations how to live and to die? How can we teach them the faith through the way we live? Um, and this is what this project of life that we're going to look at is all about. How can I live the different dimensions of my Christian life so as to transmit those values? Not just my prayer, because it's very easy to be holy in prayer, uh, if you agree with me. As they always say, we're always so holy in church, but when we're in the parking lot, we start arguing, <laughs> we start cursing. It's easy to be holy in church. It's easy to be holy in prayer. But it's not so easy to be holy at home when you have all your responsibilities. It's not easy to be holy at your workplace where there's so many temptations, threats even. It's not easy to be holy in our economic life, uh, in the way we deal with money, with our resources, the choices we make for our investments. It's not so easy to be holy in po our political life. Whoa! <laughs> How can we look at our own political responsibility as Christians uh, in the way that politics can condition culture. We cannot deny that. Uh, all these elements are part of Christian life. And this project of life is, help, is meant to help us to reflect on how do we live our Christian lives and sometimes choose to die in certain ways to witness to Christian values, which is difficult in our, in our, in our society. It's always been difficult. So, yeah, so a little bit of that. No, for these three challenges, spiritual, cultural, and educational. Okay, so, uh, great. So, yet we are not going to talk about death here, and so, so you can look at the handout a little bit yourself. So, I'm going to go straight to these questions here. Can you see that? Uh, why make a project of life? I've just kind of uh, explained it. I'll just read it through to, to enumerate them no, for our reflection. First, to help concretize, materialize, or really specify our path to sainthood. Uh, for a Christian, sainthood means discipleship. Okay? So for a person, a couple, and a family, how can we lift it out in the concrete details of our life? And we're going to work, look at them in the worksheet. All right? So uh, don't worry. To have, number two, to have a tool for dialogue and evaluation of my progress in discipleship. So once again, to be holy as a Christian, if we look at the Bible, if we look at the Gospels, it's about becoming Jesus' disciple, to learn from him at every stage of our lives. You know, um, sometimes we might feel that, uh, you know, old dogs can learn new tricks. I'm already old. Is it really worth changing my mindset? I'll just give you an example. There's a man whom I know who had throat cancer, and he's still suffering from it now. And uh, he was diagnosed with it. They decided to go for the operation. And to cut the story short, he's still in the stage of recovery after one year. He changed the stents in his throat. Uh, they reconnected his stomach right quite with another uh, part of his intestine to his, uh, the, the, the upper part of his throat. Um, he still has a bag for releasing his, uh, you know, excesses uh, for one year. And one day he said, I don't want to live anymore. And I already felt a challenge in our sufferings, in our difficulties. How can we continue transmitting the value of life, of living? So when we really, and, and you know what we encouraged him? It was really funny. We encouraged him to read about death, about suffering, about pain. Face it squarely. Don't just think about the things you're missing out on life. Think about what you're going to face in death. He looked at it. He read about it. He read all the teachings of the church about suffering and pain and death. And you know what? He found the meaning to continue living. It's really amazing how discipleship can continue at every stage of our lives. He's already uh, 70. Every stage of our life, we can still keep learning. 
And maybe there are certain mindsets that we need to change in order to keep growing. You know, I'm going to show you a little uh, poster that I really love. It says here, as you grow and evolve, it might feel like you're losing your mind. At the late stage of your life, you might feel that this is crazy. I've lost all meaning to live. But you're just, but what's happening is that you're just losing the old mindset that was holding you back from something new about life. Every stage we are invited to grow of our lives. And you know, they always say, this is the cycle of life. You are born, you grow, and either you change or you die. Either you change or you die. And this is what Father James said with uh, Henry Newman, if you remember. To live is to change often. And even now, at every stage of our life, it's a time to keep changing. So, discipleship. This project of life, if we do it diligently, if we cannot finish it today, it's fine because it's something that I took years to do myself, okay? So, but this is an introduction just to a teaser for you to be interested that there can be a way to grow concretely in holiness. So to have a tool for dialogue means that my holiness needs to be accountable. I need to share it with someone to guide me, to hold me accountable, and to help me to grow. And that's discipleship with Jesus, with a mature Christian, not necessarily a priest, because sometimes we priests are not that mature ourselves, and we need to keep maturing. But there are Christians who are mature, who can guide us to keep on growing in discipleship, and hopefully, of course, priests, sisters, and etc. Okay, that's number two. And number three, to cultivate real virtues of being a follower of Christ in this life. So being accountable means I have to check, am I growing real in real virtues of my Christian life, of holiness, so that I keep dying every day, as Father James said, and the younger generation will be convinced by the values that I'm trying to transmit by my project of a holy life. Okay, so John 3, 12. Sorry, how many more minutes do I have? Okay, so uh, John 3, 12. Jesus said to Nicodemus, okay, we can put our place ourselves. When we do this project of life, we can place ourselves in the, the person of Nicodemus. They were having a dialogue about relig religion, what's right, what's wrong. And Jesus said, if you do not believe me when I speak to you about earthly things, how will you believe me when I speak to you about heavenly things? Meaning, if you do not believe me uh, about the concrete dimensions of our economic life, about ecology, about your social life, about your family relationships, if you don't listen to me about these very concrete things in your life, how are you going to understand me when I talk about death, about heaven, about the, the abstract things of the future that we cannot see? And so Jesus was trying to teach Nicodemus, let me be your master, be my disciple in these earthly realities first, and then you will understand what heaven is about, what death is about, what all this sunrise and sunset is all going to be about. Let me teach you these things. No, So this is the invitation of Jesus in this project of life. Now, before we go directly into that project uh, to look at those dimensions, uh, I hope you're okay. You're still following on this. Um, there's some five basic questions that I would like you to reflect on, invite you to reflect on about discipleship. Okay? Uh, being Christian is not just going to church. We know this. Um, but these five questions are going to help us to examine ourselves whether I'm just a Sunday Catholic, okay, or just a church goer. These questions will help me to examine if I'm a real disciple of Jesus. Okay, what uh, Father James said, whether I really know Jesus, if that is eternal life. Uh, so these are, I'll just go through them a little bit. And, um, and maybe later at the end of this session, if we have time, you could reflect on them. But these are worth to reflect on them even in our daily lives, okay? So the first question, do I have a personal relationship with God? Uh, it might sound like a superficial question over here. <laughs> of course, no. <laughs> But think about it. Um, is he like a real person for me as my husband or my wife is, or my brother in community, 
or my sister or my parents, does he talk to me? Uh, do I know what he thinks? Do I know what he feels about me? Uh, do I know what his desires are, his dreams? Uh, because if he's a real person to me, these are part of a personality. What is the personality of Jesus? Uh, you know, if you just think about it, sometimes our answer could be, I don't know. I don't really know. Um, because I only rely on what the priest says, the homily says, I go to Mass, I uh, uh, even when I read the Bible, I just look at the, the little things about applying to my life. I seldom ask, Jesus, who are you? Who are you for me? Why did you say that word? Uh, why did you heal the person? Or why didn't you heal that one? Um, why were you speaking like that? Were you talking to me? You know, when we ask these questions, we kind of enter into the personality uh, of Jesus. A real disciple learns about him, about Jesus. Do I really have a personal relationship with God? And if the answer is uh, no, it's fine. Uh, we can always start. And if the answer is yes, then maybe we can ask, how can I know him better? Uh, through the scriptures, when I pray, when I go to the, some of us are joining the school of the word. Um, how is the school of the word helping me to know Jesus as a person who is my friend, who is my lover, perhaps, who is the, the kindest person I know, who's my inspiration. You know, something that inspires me a lot uh, when, when we are supposed to love people. It's not so much, uh, you know, when you watch uh, the saints and all that, and sometimes they move you to tears the way that they love. It's not so much of the pity for people that moves me to tears or the pity for people who are suffering. What many times moves me to tears is to realize how much God loves them how much Jesus loves and how a human person, a human being like us, is able to love to such an extent that moves me to tears. I think, uh, you know, coming back to the little movie clip, it's like, why did uh, he say, I'll tell you how he lived. It's not about how he died. I saw how he loved. I saw how he loved. And that moves me to want to be his disciple. That moves me to want to love like him, to be a saint. That moves me to say that the future generation has hope. If we can just share with them the values of the way Jesus lived, loved, and died. So that's the first. No? Do I have a personal relationship with God? Second, how is my trust in God? Okay, I know him. I worship him. I go to church. Do I really trust him? in the concrete details of my life? Or am I a worry monger? You know, uh, the expression, <laughs> spreading worries all over the place because I'm so worried and I don't trust really God. I don't really trust him. I'm not just asking you. I'm asking this to myself. As a missionary, as a priest, do I really trust God? Now that uh, you are in this accident, and then, you know, in an accident, there were so many things you need to think about. Do I trust that God takes care of us because he does he does um, how can I grow in my trust in God as a person because if I don't really trust God um, you know I don't I won't really do what he's telling me I mean that's the fact <laughs> I don't really trust him so so this in this project of life as we go through we're just preparing the dispositions okay if you like if I want to really have a project of life I need to know I need to grow in trust. How can I grow in my trust in God? Okay, I invite you just to think about it. Um, on the third question, am I curious to know more about Jesus? Am I curious to know about him? Um, yeah, so this is somehow connected to the first number that I just mentioned. Um, or am I just happy to just pray and thank God for what he does for me? and then uh, ask for the things that I need every day, which is part of the prayer. And we need to do that still, you know? But am I really curious to know him for who he is? The fourth, am I open to what he would tell me? Ooh, another one, tough one. Am I really, have you been to a silent retreat? Because actually in silence, God really speaks. Many people are afraid of silence. Why? Because they hear many things. And sometimes we might be afraid to hear 
what God really wants and what he really thinks? Um, am I open to what he would tell me? Do I trust him enough? So it's, can you see all the questions that are building things up? Do I know him? As a, do I have a relationship? Do I trust him enough? And am I curious enough to know what he really wants to tell me? Because the saints were people who heard Jesus tell them personally what he wanted from them as well. You know, as friends, we, are not, we don't just receive. As friends also, we, we try to give. So if we're really friends of Jesus, then we also need to know what he wants from us. Um, oh, we need to trust him enough. Okay. And then the last question there, number five, do I have the intention of being Christ's disciple? Do you really want to be his disciple? Um, and if your answer is, I don't know, that's fine. No, we can continue praying about it. <laughs> <laughs> because number five implies number one to four. Um, and it's a tough question. And sometimes I ask this to myself. In all these new situations that come, because at every stage of life, there are different challenges. Uh, I'm not the same when I was at 20 years old. I'm different when I'm 30. I'm different when I'm 40. I'm 50, etc. So at every stage, we need to ask ourselves, do I still want to be his disciple? And if our answer is, you know... As St. Peter said no, to Jesus, Lord, you know me, but you know that I love you. I want to follow you. And if we just open our hearts in sincerity and humility before Jesus, he's going to help us. And that's God. Okay. So, so these five helpful questions to ask ourselves. Okay. Now, very briefly, the characteristics of the project of life. Uh, it has to be realistic. Okay, so uh, don't be too ambitious, you know, like our New Year resolutions. We put 10 and then, no, okay. So here, we are, I'm only going to ask you to think of three things. Okay, out of the whole list, I'm going to show you, we can only work on three things in our life, okay, every year. Second, considering what is beneficial for my stage of life. As I said, we can't think of our faith as teenagers, okay. <laughs> we got to think of our faith as where we are and what's good for us. Third, to compare and discuss it with a spiritual director. As I said, uh, it's meant to be contrasted with someone who can guide us, not necessarily to teach us everything, but just to contrast and to be accountable. Uh, and that's why a project of life will make it very efficient. You know, uh, when you talk about spiritual directors today, sometimes you think, oof, there's so few. So it's true. <laughs> there are few. So we need an efficient method of spiritual direction, uh, direction so that the few can help many more, okay? So this project of life is meant for that, to discuss with that spiritual director. And lastly, to live one month with this project that you are going to do, hopefully, if you can, in order to see if it is adapted to the reality and obligations that I live. And then, again, to discuss it after a month with the spiritual director. So if you have questions, just hold on. <laughs> uh, I think I'll try to leave a space for that. Um, but I want to go just very, very briefly into the project because it's very, I know you people will know how to do it very easily um, by just looking at it. But just briefly to see that what are the things that you need to do in the task of the project of life. There you see five or six uh, things there, no? A personal theme, a central biblical passage, a general objective, etc. Okay, so for example, I'm going to share with you my example that I've lived for 12 years. Okay, my project of life for 12 years, which took me a few years to make actually. Okay, I did it in my perpetual perpetual vows, and uh, I'm surprised at myself. After 12 years, I'm still using the same project. It's modified. There are changes. I've uh, matured, hopefully, a little bit, grown older, uh, etc. The body, you know, okay. So my personal theme is actually universal brother of the word of God. Okay, that was my theme because we are Verbum Dei, um, but we're not just Verbum Dei as experts in the Bible, but we are brothers or sisters of everyone, universal. Everyone is my brother and sister, and what I can offer them is the word of God. That's been my theme for 12 years. Uh, what is your theme? Okay, uh, uh, again, don't rush yourself. This is just an introduction, and hopefully there could be other moments we could share more, okay? So just an example. Central biblical passage for me is the Good Samaritan. Okay, uh, that's the first passage I actually read as a Christian. I'm not 
uh, baptized. I was not baptized at birth. I got to know about Christianity much later. And in class, a Bible, what do you call it, religious uh, studies class in high school, we used to have it. The first passage actually that really touched me was the Good Samaritan. And I was not a Catholic yet, nor a Christian. Um, and until today, it's a central passage for me because Jesus is the one who wants to heal the wounded man. And he was that universal brother first. And I see myself as the innkeeper, if you're familiar with the passage. And he gave me two coins to take care of that wounded man. And for me, as a priest today, the two coins are the word of God and the sacraments. And with these two, I'm taking care of the wounded man and being a universal brother. But the first Samaritan who inspired me, who loved so much, was Jesus. And he trusts me enough to give me that person to take care of. Okay, and which is humanity in general. Okay, next. I, I can't elaborate too much. General objective, general objective is to be like Jesus. Simple as that. The general objective is to be a disciple and to learn to be like Jesus. Okay? And uh, something I shared already. To learn how he thinks, how he feels, how he loves, what he wants, etc. As any human being, uh, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. That's my general objective. Okay? And the specific objectives will be based on the project of life. So... Um, to be specific in the virtue or the habit to work on. We're going to look at them, okay? And from the nine, we're going to choose three, okay? I invite you to choose three. If you're very good at multitasking, maybe you can do more. Or if not, you can just choose one, all right? So based on those specific objectives that we're going to show, we're going to, uh, you have to set your goals. Like how much do you want to achieve? Okay, this is like uh, planning your project for the year, no? <laughs> okay, and the points to work out, being very concrete. I'll just uh, go straight there. And the timetable. Uh, okay. Okay, I've got 15 minutes. So I really want to leave a space, so I'll just go very quickly. Uh, but the timetable is like a weekly timetable, okay? If I, I'm not sure if we're used to this, but to work on virtues, we need to set a timetable as well. It doesn't come spontaneously. So if I want to work on my prayer life, I have to say this time, I'm going to set aside this week, I'm going to stick to it. So that's why I said, don't choose too many because you can't fit everything in. Okay, so a timetable. If my timetable is to grow in the virtue of charity or generosity, for example, I need to set a schedule to be extra generous and charitable every week. Okay, so let's look at it. Uh, different, this is scheme or the outline for accompaniment of the project of life, personally or as a family. So uh, if you can progress, not all of us can do it as a family, but at least personally. So as you can see there, there's a previous project for those who have done it before. There's a personal evaluation of how I lived my project last year or last month. There's the discussion with the spiritual director, the accountability, and then the projection. What are the priorities I want to work out, how to work them out, and to create a new project, okay? So I think these are not difficult terms to understand. Uh, when you think about it with time, you'll have it. So, as you can see on the left side, priorities to work out, and the right side, the practical way how to work them out. So, what are the different areas we can work? You know, there's a human, and if you can look there, psychological. So, I would summarize it like that. You know? Your emotional, your physical, and your relational aspects. You no, know? oh, Sorry, your intellectual aspects. So, you, you can read there. It's a whole list there that will take... Uh, a year of formations to explain. <laughs> but but it's, I, I just want to present the, the areas so that you can see that, you know, that we really can work out how to be more human. Okay, uh, and it's not spontaneous. We, it's a dedication to become holy. Okay, uh, so there's a human area. So I, again, I summarize the, uh, the physical, my health as well, my fitness, uh, how I take care of what I eat, etc. The emotional. So what do I eat emotionally? As for example, in the pandemic, it's not good to just watch any kind of video because it feeds our emotions positively or negatively. Uh, and also intellectually, what do I feed my mind with? You know, um, so our minds are like the stomach of our soul. <laughs> As they say, you are, you are or you become what you eat. 
So it depends on what we feed our minds with, we become that person. We have to choose what we read as well. Okay, so the human side. Spiritual, uh, our prayer life, basically, how we grow in our prayer life, um, in the daily personal prayer, but also in the sacraments. Now in the pandemic, how do we lift the sacraments? A challenging question. But it's also about virtues, developing virtues of charity, of chastity also, of uh, generosity, of humility. Ooh, okay. So, virtues. And values. What are the values? It's beautiful to think of what really are the values that perhaps I already have and I, that I want to transmit as well. Okay? And other things. Spiritual direction, spiritual readings, etc. Okay? We can think about that. Marriage. This is not for me, uh, but it could be for you, okay? Marriage is not spontaneous, as we know. Uh, the wedding is just the start. You know, in our catechism, and when we counsel courting couples and engaged couples, this is what we tell them. Marriage is not the end. And the wedding is just the start. So be prepared for it. you got to work at it. And for those who have lived it long enough, you know that. How do you work on your friendship as a couple? Uh, how do you work on your passion and your love? Not just friendship. I mean, you don't need to get married to be friends. Uh, how do you work on your communication skills? What are the five languages of love? Uh, what is the language of love of your spouse? No? Do you know that? Uh, what kind of common projection do you do as a couple? Do you discuss about your plans still? Not just at the beginning, but even now? So there are things to work out also in the marriage. Okay, family. Family, of course, extends to beyond the marriage. So I'm just very fast because I just want to go through, okay? Um, but I think you have more contents in your own life. So family means a family project of life, thinking of your children, education, thinking about organization and discipline. Maybe for certain couples, you're already stable enough. For some, there are still things to work out. As a couple, how do you want to agree on discipline? Or how can you help maybe your grandparent and how can you help your children? to organize and discipline as well, respecting their autonomy, okay. The house, the organization, etc. So I think you're all very organized people, so I don't have to say so much about that. I hope I'm right, okay. So, and then work, of course, another aspect, which is the professional ethics and skills, okay. Um, once again, knowing the audience I have, maybe this is not so uh, essential for you to work out uh, but to recognize also the gifts that you have developed. Maybe you have a good system of your profession at the prof professional level. It's good to be aware of them uh, and to know how to share them as well. You know your work attitudes, your testimony as a Christian, and your competence as well as a Christian. Budgeting and accounting. Some of us are very good at spending, but not budgeting. <laughs> okay. Or some are too good at budgeting and not at spending. So sometimes it's good to spend as well. So, etc. cetera, no? how do we work that out? Uh, if it's a priority apostolic, is something I'd like to address specifically. Do you have a ministry, a specific ministry as a Christian? Uh, of course, we always say, no, our life is our mission. No, my family is my first mission, and it's very true. But at the same time, as a Christian, you need a specifically Christian ministry to keep on growing. And that ministry is transmission of faith. So, okay, loving is my mission, but loving doesn't necessarily transmit a specific faith in Jesus Christ. So what is your specific mission or ministry in transmitting the values of Jesus Christ, the faith in Jesus Christ to those around you and to the future generations? So awareness, Ministry of the Word, which is very verbal day, our community, uh, you know, about the Bible, Jesus and the Scriptures, and how to accompany and guide the faith of others. It needs training. Uh, it's not just experience. We need to train ourselves uh, to learn the skills of how to guide and accompany others uh, spiritually. You know, this is a special uh, invite I like to uh, think, because I think if you're in this retreat, you're not a first-timer. Could you also be a spiritual guide for others? Because that will help us priests a lot. Um, maybe you could really help us to guide others who need guidance. Just think about it, okay? 
Paternal social, okay, relatives, friends, in-laws, outlaws, okay, <laughs> community of faith. Do we have a faith community that we belong to? Um, because, you know, we talked about the challenge of culture, and we need to build an alternative culture if we really want to change society. So a community of faith presents uh, the possibility of an alternative culture. What is your alternative culture of faith? Where do you belong? Which community are you working with to build this alternative culture? And if I don't have one, I invite you to think about it. And if I have one, uh, how can you grow in that commitment? Okay, service and commitment, as you see, to that community and others in society as well, okay? Not just in the community. Formation. Do I keep learning uh, intellectually as well to grow? No, spiritually, apostolically, as I said, it's not spontaneous. We need to read up. We need to attend courses, seminars, etc. Okay? So it says here some examples. Now, as a mother, I need to train myself. There are new things about motherhood that are so complex nowadays. We never talked about psychology uh, maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, Same-sex attraction. Oof, big topic. Worries parents have for their children who might be of same-sex attraction. How do we deal with that? We need formations. So not to turn off uh, or to scare you know, our children about these topics. Doctrinal and cultural formations. So about church teaching, but as well about culture. How we can help others to grow in culture and not just force them to be religious. Okay? So that's it. So these are the different categories. And... Uh, Sorry, how many minutes more do we have before that? Well, oh, only five minutes. I'm so sorry. Uh, I wanted to leave a time for sharing um, or questions, but um, I know that probably you have questions. Um, can, we, can we open it up a bit for... Yeah. yeah? So, so maybe those who want to ask questions, you can put it in the chat box to say, I do or something, and then... We'll just have five minutes. I'm very sorry. Or, or, or you can ask in the chat box. We can take it up. Uh, and it will help us also in our future. No? Or, or if you have some suggestions also, initiatives about this project of life. Yeah. But, okay. So, so but the, this, this, just to summarize, no, before that, I'm very sorry. It's just a short time. Uh, to summarize, at the end of this session, when we, after the retreat, okay, I invite you to really go through that list of the worksheet. Try to identify which are the three priorities that you would like to work at for 2021. Okay, 2021. Because we're at the end of 2020, it's very providential to do this retreat now. And I think it's also somehow apt knowing the pandemic situation, knowing the uncertainties that are coming in the coming year, it will be very apt to make a project of life, thinking of the future, thinking of how we want to live it in a saintly way as a disciple of Christ. So remember realistic three things I would like to work at and think of how I would work on them. And if I need help, who can I ask? okay, uh, to guide me in this project.